Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My dear brothers and sisters, welcome to Dome Podcast, and I'm your host Hatem al Abdul Salam. And today we have an honourable guest. Uh, our guest is Imam Qasim Rashid Ahmed. Salam alaikum, Imam. How are you? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Uh, as best as could be, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, in, uh, good fiza of uh, Oman. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. First of all, uh, welcome to Oman, uh, your second home, and we're very honored to have you here in Oman and in Al Astiqama uh, TV. And uh, today um, we want uh, to learn from the vast experience uh, of social work that you've been uh, doing for the past uh, years. You're well renowned uh, around the world, mashallah. But uh, first, uh, to introduce our viewers and listeners uh, to you, to your personality and your upbringing, tell us a little bit about your childhood. Where were you born and, uh, and raised? Um, yes, uh, I was born in India, but uh, I was only a few months old when my parents moved to Kenya. Mashallah. First, my father went, and then uh, when I was about six months old, and myself and my mom uh, moved to Kenya, alhamdulillah. Uh, this was in 1970. Mashallah. Was there a particular reason why uh, your yes, parents uh, moved to Kenya? Uh, mashallah, I belong to a family uh, for generations. Uh, they are scholars of Islam, uh, ulama of deen, uh, muftiyan, wa hakada. Mashallah. Uh, for at least 250 years, uh, we know the lineage. Mashallah. Um, so, my, and my, gra my grandfather made a rule that uh, any boy in my generation, in my family, has to be half of Qur'an minimum. Mas MashaAllah. And uh, if possible, then uh, alim also. So, Alhamdulillah, in my grandfather and my grandfather's brothers and sisters and their children, uh, we are over 300 uh, ulama. MashaAllah. And nearly Masha 500 Huffaz, MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Masha um, May Allah bless you and reward you all for your efforts. Alhamdulillah. Um, Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And uh, my father was eldest son, um, and at the age of 24, he wrote Tafsir of Quran with the name of Dars al Quran. In, 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 the, in the language of Urdu. Urdu, yes. yes from uh, Arabic to Urdu. Um, Dars al Quran in six volumes. Uh, now, this is in 1960s. Uh, at that time, uh, books were the medium of social media, you can say. <laughs> the, uh, when people still re read books that's and right. cherish books. When the principal, who was the head of all the ulama of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, when he saw the ability, um, he sent my father to Kenya. Uh, to be not only Imam of Masjid, but also to be advisor to the president of Kenya, Mashallah. Jammu Kenya. So, mashallah, he had very good life, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. well respected alhamdulillah. life. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And then many of the uh, students of my father, they moved to UK, London, yes. Yes. Uh, especially at the time of Idi Amin and so on, yes. uh, with Uganda and like that. Um, so, in 1983, um, uh, my father decided to move to UK on the request or order of same scholar principal, he ordered him in 1982 that you should to move to the to, UK. To move UK. I think you were at the age of 13 or 12 at that time. 12. 12. Yes. 12. Um, no, the order came in 1982, uh, but uh, the way he ordered, he said that is my final wish. Um, uh, For you to move to the UK. That's right. And soon after writing that letter, he passed away. Subhanallah. So my Allah. father took it even more serious that he, he fulfilled uh, his wish, the, the wish right. of his teacher. Now I, I want, I'm very much interested about the journey of your family with uh, memorizing of the Quran. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of young people now who are in the journey of memorizing the Quran. Can you please give us um, the tariqa or the way that uh, your family memorizes the Quran, the tips? What are the things that you should do and what are the things that you should uh, refrain from doing yes. to be able to memorize the Quran because for many people uh, it seems like an impossible thing mm -hmm. to do uh, to memorize the entire Quran yes, but uh, uh, mashallah through your vast experience maybe you can share some uh, insight yes most important thing uh, is for the child who's memorizing Quran to believe sincerely and uh, at highest level that this is definitely 100% book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather than considering a holy book or holy scripture just yes. a, you can say religious book 
No, it is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It yes. is basically um, best book in the world. Yes. So when this is your belief, uh, then rest of the journey becomes easier. Mashallah. In terms of uh, method, uh, the way we, uh, in our entire family, the way we do is yes. uh, normally we use the Quran which has 15 lines. Yes. So on that, uh, every page begins with new ayah and ends at the ayah. Yes. Uh, 59 Quran. Um, and uh, we aim to memorize one page or two page um, of Quran per day. Uh, per day. Per day. Um, and then reaching towards the end, it uh, increases even three, four pages. At the start, maybe half a page or quarter of page and so on. Imam Qasim, I wanted to ask you, in terms of dealing with young kids at the age of four and five, uh, you want them to take the journey of memorizing. Uh, do you start and get them into the tajweed first or do they start with the memorize immediately? Um, because the, the tajweed it, by itself is a science. Yeah, yeah so we start with ad'iyah. Ad'iyah. Yes, with okay. du'as. Uh, with kalima, uh, shahada and like that, kalimat and ad'iyah. So they get used to repeating uh, them. That's right, yes. yes. So even if they make mistake, at least they're making mistakes or even if for rest of their life they pick wrong pronunciation, yes. um, they're picking up on non-Quranic verses. Yes. So on Ad'iyah they start, but of you course... Mean, I mean, you mean the Ad'iyah that are from the Sunnah? That's right. Not, yeah. not the verses of the Quran? That's right, yes. yes. Um, like, Allahumma uh, bismika amutu wa ahya, alhamdulillah, illazi yat'amana wa asqala. So anything to do, wearing your slippers. So the tongue gets used to the, the Arabic words? That's right, yes. Yeah. Um, when we recite salah uh, in front of children, then when we are uh, praying uh, nafil yes. salah, we recite a bit loudly so the child can hear Mashallah. Um, what we're reciting and so on. So that helps upbringing of child. And if someone tries this for just a couple of weeks, you will see big difference on your child. Mashallah. Um, so mashallah, those methods we ad adopt. And then um, when it comes to memorization of Quran, Let's say we want to memorize this page. First, we will read entire page three times by looking at it very carefully. Three times. Uh, we will. Then after that, line by line or ayah by ayah, we will try to memorize. Yes. And the best time according to us to memorize uh, is after Maghrib. After Maghrib? Yes. Any specific reason why after Maghrib? Uh, I don't know exact reason, but... Um, uh, this is uh, the custom that uh, you, you Because you uh, af it. between Asr and Maghrib is considered as free time. Yes. Or family time or social time. Yes. And um, after Maghrib is the beginning um, of... Of the can, night. Uh, of the night, uh, or beginning of new day, you can call yes. it. Uh, and angels, they change shift. So that is the time of blessing. Um, so you, you, you basically, between Maghrib and Isha, uh, one hour you focus on memorizing that page and so on. Um, some uh, focus only for 20 minutes or half an hour. And then after Fajr, um, you memorize again, uh, same page. Mashallah. So you have to give a gap in between. If you think that, you let me start memorizing after Maghrib and after Isha, I want to read to teacher. Uh, then uh, it's not going to be that easy and there will be more mistakes. Yes. But if you sleep on it, you know, the way they say that you take, you write something or you... And then you sleep on it. Yeah. yeah, and then sleep on it. So physically you sleep on it and the next morning you uh, memorize again. Uh, it, it, it will be it much, much easier, easier mashallah. So. Then second thing is when we recite to the teacher, then last three days uh, lessons, what we memorize in last three days, we would recite that also Mashallah. to the teacher. Mm. And then in the afternoon, after Zohar, we would recite one quarter or half juz, um, or if we are towards the end of Quran, then f full juz yes. every day uh, between Zohar and uh, uh, study time, you can say, which is like 4 p.m. until Mashallah. and so on. So. Um, we would uh, we would recite to the teacher the new lesson, last three days lesson, and the quarter Jews or half Jews or uh, depends what Mashallah. level we are at. Mashallah. Now, Imam, Imam, I want to take you back to the the journey from Kenya to the UK. Yes. You are at the age of twelve, 
uh, you lived in Kenya, it's a mixed uh, country where you have Muslims and you have also people of other faiths. Yes. But now suddenly you, uh, you move to the UK, which is a dominant non-Muslim country. Uh, how did you cope as a child with the culture, with the environment, the language, and, and so on? Yes, uh, I, from childhood I'm a very different person. Uh, yes. SubhanAllah. Uh, Allah brought me up uh, in that manner. So, for, at the age of six, I used to read newspapers. MashaAllah. Uh, Masha that Allah. is articles written by elders yes. on world affairs and so on. Um, but uh, when my father moved to UK, at that time I was doing Tahfiz al Quran in yes. India. Uh, memorization of Quran. So you did not move with them in, in the I beginning? In the, not in the beginning. Yes. But I moved in 1984. Uh, my father uh, received order in 1982, but he moved in 1983. And a so couple of months later in 1984, uh, we moved there. I was 14 years old at that time. Now, at that point, I used to hate English language. And I used to think that if I speak English, I will become like English culture. Like them, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, because every language has its own gravity and so on. Yes. So uh, it was settled in my mind as a child, uh, basically, that uh, if I speak other languages, then their culture will come. And that's why being in Kenya, I didn't speak Swahili much. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, we, we spoke off air about uh, Swahili and you said you don't remember yeah. much of the Swahili. My, my sisters, two sisters, they were born in Kenya, but uh, mashallah, they speak, fluent, uh, still yeah. uh, speak of Swahili. But I didn't speak much even in Kenya. I stick to my Urdu language. So when I moved to UK, you know, I was nearly 15 years old. In UK, by law, you have to go to school up to the age of 16. So you, now you're forced. You're going to public school, I would assume, and everybody speaks English. Uh, well, I try to avoid as much as possible, saying yes. that, look, I've passed that age now, and uh, you know, I'm 15 years old, I cannot be sitting with five-year-old children in, in same class and so on. So I skipped the school. Um, and I went to Darul Uloom uh, in UK, where basically it is Islamic studies, um, all basically starting from uh, small books, uh, learning Arabic language and yes. fiqh and sunnah, dirasa and so on like that. All different subjects, uh, mashallah, and it's eight years uh, journey. Mashallah, eight years, eight. since the age of 15. Yes. So I started that at the age of 15, Mashallah, 15, 16. And uh, for eight years I studied that. And uh, that education was because all the teachers were from India. Um, so it was in Urdu. Urdu, well, yeah. to, uh, Arabic. Yes. So all the books were starting from Urdu, shifting towards Arabic. So after two, three years, all the books are purely Arabic language. Yes. Um, and then uh, 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 Shamail Tirmidhi and like that, progressing up to Sahih Bukhari and Siha Sitta and like that, mashallah. mashallah. So covering all the subjects, uh, uh, Tafsir, Tariq, and uh, Mantiq, Falsafa, Ilmul Kalam, Ilmul Bayan, Ilmul Badi, Hakada. Mashallah. mashallah. So now because I was in Darul Uloom and all the edu whole education was in Arabic and Urdu, uh, I didn't get a chance to. Learn English. Learn English. Yes. Um, and uh, if I try to speak in front of others, I will basically embarrass myself. Yes. So when I finish my education, then principal, he called me and he said, now you're going out in public. And if you want to serve public properly, you have to speak English. MashaAllah. <laughs> so then, yes, uh, by listening how other people speak, uh, I started to... To catch uh, up the language. Yeah. Now, Imam Qasim, let me ask you. Uh, at that age, 15, mostly young people, they have the ambition, especially um, uh, us, uh, the Eastern communities, uh, you want to see your son a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. What made you shift towards the Sharia studies and not this common line of you know, uh, occupations that uh, Eastern family normally insist on? Yes, uh, uh, first of all, um, I knew that I have to do helps of Qur'an because that's yes. a culture of family. So that I knew. But apart from that, I had ambitions to be pilot uh, initially. Oh, so the idea was there. Uh, as a child. Yes. 
Well, uh, as I told you, I used to read newspapers, so I read uh, at that time that uh, one aeroplane crashed and this and that and how it happened. And I thought, no, this uh, so I can't, I don't want to go in a profession where basically I'm responsible for the lives of people. Yes. And uh, in the article, it was basically a complaint about uh, the pilot. Uh, it was his fault. It was his fault. So um, I got very upset that uh, how can you be a pilot and then do some silly so mistake. So Allah was sending you a message. Yeah. That's and then um, at one occasion, my father, uh, so my uh, dream was then to become doctor. Yes. In one Jumu'ah, my father gave lecture uh, about the Tughyan in, uh, in, in the Bahr and river and sea yes. uh, around midday time. Yes. And he said this is a very dangerous time to be uh, in the middle of ocean, especially for a small The boat. high tide, yeah. Yes. yes. Um, now my GP, uh, my family GP at that time in Kenya, he went for uh, in the river uh, for fishing and like that with his family and the boat overturned. Subhanallah. And somehow he managed to survive, but his entire family was drawn away. Subhanallah. And he lost his family. And I said, how can you be a doctor and be so stupid? My father gave that lecture on this Friday. Subhanallah. And he didn't follow that advice. I said, I think my father is best. I just want to be like my father. Subhanallah. So that was the changing moment. These two incidents happened. And then you... Uh, you uh, made up your mind. Yeah, you made I made up, up my mind. mind. And I said to my father that I don't want to be only just Hafiz of Quran, but I want to do the same study as you. Uh, later on, you moved on and progressed uh, serving the community. And uh, you started Al Khair Foundation. That's right, yes. Tell us uh, about Al Khair Foundation. How did it start? Because I understand as a young man, you would, okay, you are in the line of Sharia, but at the same time, you might think of business, you might think of, you know, progressing your life with the normal things that uh, people do, get married, have children, you know, earn a living. But uh, you went into something totally different, which is the relief work. So what um, is Al Khair Foundation yeah, re about? Relief work came quite, la quite later stage, um, uh, but uh, uh, before that was primary and secondary schools. Um, purely on education, but uh, something I would like to add, how yes. I reach over there. Yes. Um, SubhanAllah, um, when I was nine years old, when I moved to in, uh, India yes. uh, for Tahfiz al-Quran, uh, there was this lady who used to come to houses for cleaning and like that, and her husband passed away. And um, a few m weeks or few months later, the landlord threw her belonging out of the house and she was homeless. And she had no place to live, and she had a small, small children, six, seven children, and so on. Yes. And I was crying so much. And I said to my grandfather that we need to do something for her. And he said, yes, we'll give a couple of hundred rupees. I said, but that will not do. Then I spoke to my uncle, and then I wrote a letter to my father. Can you ask my grandfather to give me my pocket money of holy year? Because one lady, she's homeless. I want to help her. Subhanallah. Right? Um, so he gave that money um, uh, or the request. Your of, allowance for uh, one year. For one year, yeah, which my father sent. Obviously at that time it used to be by post only, so that took about two, three weeks to get the answer. He gave me that money. I bought dua cards. Um, you know, at that time there used to be stickers you stick on your cycle or your yes. own motorbike or at your door or cards of duas and like that. So I bought that and I started to sell those um, Dua uh, cards. Uh, yes, to students and so on. And that's how basically every day I started to make profit. Then uh, um, uh, I realized that uh, I was watching all the people and I see that certain people coming from different area and they have different shape of Kalansawa. Yes, the topi, the, cap, the hat. Yes. Uh, this area wearing this type, that area wearing this, that type. But there is no shop which sells every type of Qalan Sawa. So you just walk in and choose whatever you want. Yeah, so I started, uh, you can say, a stall with different type of Qalan Sawa. And this is at the age of nine? Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, at, at, nine, at, yeah, at the age of nine. MashaAllah. And um, after working about six, seven months, I saved enough money to buy 105 square meter land Masha at Allah. the age of nine for Masha that Allah. lady, Masha Allah. Um, for that family. And then continued with the business uh, while memorizing Quran. 
and at the age of 10 uh, had enough money to construct her house three bedroom house two floor and like that subhanallah, mashallah. Subhanallah. and um, there was mixed feelings some of my family was happy some were that what he's doing and this and that yeah. uh, but that's how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought me up mashallah. mashallah and from there i went into kind of you can say business activities and social enterprise but my intention throughout was to help others uh, when I moved to UK, then over there I looked for business opportunities and so on that will not affect my education life. No. But subhanAllah, at uh, certain points, my income was more than the doctors and engineers of the time while I'm a student. SubhanAllah. And with that money, I invested basically in purchasing of land and so on. And after basically uh, 15 years, 20 years, that land was worth maybe 100 times more, 200 times more. Mashallah, so. mashallah. When 2005 earthquake came of India and Pakistan, uh, at that time everybody went to Pakistan uh, to, for relief work. For relief work. Yes. I also went to Pakistan. That was my first ever visit to Pakistan in my life. Uh, I went there, but when I came back from there, uh, I didn't go as an organization. I just went as, as a person. As a person, yes. yes. With our own, with three, four friends of mine. Everybody had a bit of their own money, and we went to help out. Uh, when I came back to UK, um, I called my uncle that Alhamdulillah I've arrived safely and so on, because he was concerned that I'm from India and going to Pakistan with political. Yes. So I called him, I arrived. he goes, uh, nobody came to India side. I said, what happened there? He said, earthquake came here also. SubhanAllah. So before reaching home, I booked my flight for next day to India. Um, now India, earthquake was in Kashmir area, which yes. is restricted area. That's right. And general Indians are generally not allowed to go there. Yes. So I arrived in India, but nobody is willing to take me there because it's restricted area. Yes. So I had to find my own way. Uh, to, to, to get into, to, to that, get into Kashmir. Place, yes. Um, and uh, then when I landed there, um, they asked me who you are and this and I said, I'm teacher and like that. Oh, you have a student say, I said, yes, there must be some. You know. <laughs> so, <how laughs> so, so, so like that. And when I came out of the airport, I just went, I said, there is Dar Darulum Islamia Arabia. Yes. I just made the name. Darulum Islamia Arabia. So can you take me there? And uh, they said, oh, that Arabic Darulum? I said, yes. They took me there. Uh, they so, took you. And there then I asked that I want to go to these earthquake areas and so on. So yes. slowly, slowly developed. MashaAllah, by selling my own land, um, now in... in the, the one in the UK? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. I bought in UK and India. Yes. Uh, in India also. Uh, UK was just a small section, but mainly majority of the land was in India. Yes. Because uh, in India, I used to study government policies at that time for their expansion, where they were going to build highway. Yes. Uh, you know, as a child to study that. SubhanAllah. So, uh, and th looking at their country planning, uh, county or you, country You were able to tell where the, the, the development is and you bought the, That's right, the yes. property there. So, uh, so if any bank, for example, from Europe wants to open a branch in India and they're looking for a land, I used to approach them that I have a land. <laughs> MashaAllah. So th that's how MashaAllah. Now, in India, in an earthquake, government of India was much better in emergency response than Pakistan. Mm. In India, the death rate was very low. Yes. And all the injured people were accounted for within 24 hours. Yes. And uh, within 72 hours, everybody were in camps or alternative accommodation like that. And then government announced that they will build houses for um, those families who have lost, lost the houses. Yes. But there is some exclusion. Mm. And uh, they said that certain families, we will not compensate them because they consider them um, against the government or yes. this and that. So without going into much detail, 412 families they identified. 412? Yeah, that they will not build their houses. Yes. Out of them, <coughs> 387 families' houses were built 
with my own money, alhamdulillah. Subhanallah, mashallah, yeah. mashallah. So that is the, mashallah, upbringing Allah put me alhamdulillah, on. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And this is done without any fundraising exercise. Uh, Imam Qasim, I want to ask you a very important question where people now, uh, some Muslims, are concerned about their wealth. They think that if I give this to Isabilillah, then, you know, I, I'm losing a lot of money. Mm -hmm. What has this done to your life? You know, the, the contributions that you have done to the community. What did, what did it change to, in, in your life? I will give one secret. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, I hope that uh, somebody must be practicing this, inshallah, and they must have seen khair and barakah in this. You know, if you want to invest your money, yes. you look at basically you, the status of your partner, mm. who you're investing with. If they are very strong and capable, then you do experience. Part yeah, you yeah. do partnership with them. Yes. So I say that if you want to do something, then create part Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala as one of your partner. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Who could be more stronger than Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? No one. You say that whatever income I get, a percentage of that, five percent, ten percent, twenty percent, is for Allah. Is for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. For no. people of Allah, for religious. Aid for any good cause according to the demand of Al Quran and Sunnah. No. So you make that partnership. The moment you make that partnership, there will be no loss in that business. SubhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. So uh, that's how, uh, inshallah, you can progress. Plus, uh, you know, uh, the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that man jaa bil hasanati falahu ashru amthaliya, ten times reward, is general promise for any good deed you do. Yes. For sadaqah, the promise goes up to even 700 times in normal yes. days and more in Ramadan or at the special days, special yeah. days or yes. a special uh, time of need, yes. for example. Even if it is dire need, that situation could create higher scale of the reward. Um, so subhanAllah, 700 times more reward. I understand this, that 10 times minimum Allah will give you in this world. In this world, subhanAllah. And seven, if not 700 times more. SubhanAllah. It's possible Allah will bless you 700 times more. And I'll give you one example. Yes. And my, that's my own example. Away from basically my investment and so on. Uh, because Alhamdulillah, I, I'm proud to say that I'm a person who follow principles I set the principles and I follow it yes. with istiqamah. Alhamdulillah. So when I was in UK, I made a principle that I will not spend more than 50 pence on my day per day from that income. Yes. The rest of the income is for poor people. Yes. Or for needy Alhamdulillah. Now just imagine, sometime my income was 10,000 pounds per month, Mashallah. which is about in today's rate 12, 13,000 yes. dollars per month. And I'm spending only 15 pounds, around $20 on myself. 15%? Um, you mean? Uh, no, 50 pence. 50 fi pence? P. 50 okay, p. 50 p. No, no dinar or you, no. You spend it on? On myself. On yourself? Yes. And I, for eight years, I bought three items every day. Mashallah. One bottle of milk, one piece of fruit, and one packet of biscuit. MashaAllah. No chocolate, no crisps, not, no toys, nothing. Subhanallah. That's how disciplined I was for eight years. Obviously, with time, the prices go high and things become expensive. So yes. I reduced the quality of the item I buy. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So I didn't increase the budget, but I reduced the quality. The quality. So before in UK, those who've been in UK, they, they would know that you get the milk, which is golden top. Yes. Which is pure, pure milk. So before that used to be, let's say, 20 pence. Yes. When the prices went up, uh, silver top, which used to be 16, 17p, became low, 20p. Low, lower quality. Yes. So I moved to silver one. Then I moved to other one. So, so uh, like that, basically. So uh, pomegranate is more expensive than apple or banana or orange. So I shifted, basically, uh, like that. So Alhamdulillah, for eight years, I was very disciplined. And since then, I've been very disciplined, mashallah. Mashallah. So uh, that has basically given huge khair and barakah. Now, I realize when I fin graduated that that money is not mine. I have to earn 
for myself. Yes. And along with basically that. So my own expenses, my own requirements, if I want to purchase a car, I will not touch that money. Subhanallah. I will earn additional money and from that... Uh, you can, uh, you yes. can do expenses. So, so subhanallah, um, I started job also and business also, other things and like that. And alhamdulillah, uh, I was uh, living good life. But I can tell you, subhanallah, whatever my monthly income at that time was, at that time, in 1990s, you can say, or early 2000, yes. whatever was my monthly income, that's my expenditure per hour now. Mashallah. Of my organization, mashallah. Mashallah. Maybe more than that is the expenditure per hour. Mashallah. So you see, the 700 times more yes. reward is there. But we just uh, have this fear, the unknown fear, yes. and uh, we neglect uh, what Allah has promised us. And I have seen that promise fulfilled by myself. Now, from childhood, my intention was to help others. Subhanallah. So, subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, put me in this track. Now, when I was Imam of Quran and Masjid for eight years, I was so shy to ask donation because I used to feel proud that I earn money myself and from that money I spend, you, you I don't spend need to people, ask yeah. anybody. Yes. So, uh, out of 412 houses, 387 I completed. Alhamdulillah. With, and those few houses, 20 or those 25 houses or so, that was remaining, for that it was very difficult for me to ask my friends to support me uh, on that. But with great difficulty I asked them and they assisted, mashallah. But uh, when I was eight year, uh, Imam for eight years, I never announced for anybody to, to give donations Subhanallah. Subhanallah. in eight years. Otherwise, you will find in UK, yes. many organizations, they come for collection. They, they, they collect, yes. And they Imam announced that today yes. my teacher is here, or this is scholar I know, or I've been to this institute. I used to say, I'm sorry. When I was 40 years old, that is, that is the time, mashallah, um, 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 you can say you're reaching towards maturity and Allah give you the uh, next responsibility and so on. Subhanallah, sadly around the same time, Haiti earthquake happened. Uh, subhanallah. And um, I had my first TV channel established um, uh, in 2009. Um, in UK. In 2010, uh, in January, was uh, Haiti earthquake uh, in the early hours, uh, subhanAllah. And Haiti earthquake was such disaster that in um, 20 to 30 kilometer area, which is just short area like from here to Masqat airport or yes. something like that, uh, 300,000 people were killed subhanallah. in that short area. So it was a very different emergency, very different disaster. Uh, Imam Qasim will come back to the relief work after a short break. Inshallah. Stay with us. <laughs> Dear brothers and sisters, welcome back to Dome Podcast. And today with me is our honorable Imam Qasim Rashid Ahmed. Welcome back, Imam Qasim. Now, Imam Qasim, we were talking about relief work, and mashallah, you have uh, served uh, so many different countries and nations. I heard something about you, and I want you to, uh, you know, confirm it, that your relief work goes beyond gender, color, religion, race. Why is that? Um. I think uh, first if, of all, is if, it true? If, if I, yeah, it is true. Yes. But if I explain the reasons, I will upset many. No worries. Uh, yeah. we, it, we can we can we can it, upset a few. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it's very uh, inappropriate for a person like myself, Imam, yes. to even think like that, let alone to say basically. But uh, I'll pronounce it. Yes. I believe where religion divides us, yes. humanity unites us. Indeed. I think humanity is the biggest principle. Yes. So sometimes you are divided because of religion. Yes. But humanity is one thing which connects everybody together. And isn't it the responsibility of us as Khulafa ala al-Ard, the right. custodians appointed by Allah, yes. to take care for humanity, to take care of humanity? That's right. Yes. Uh, so, selecting if someone is in 
from my tribe or my race or my religion and that is the person that I'm going to help and neglect everybody else, I think it's... Uh, no, but sometimes you come across a situation where yes. you are puzzled. For example, uh, I had my team members in India, in this northern India, in mountainous areas. Yes. Where basically certain Hindu people were trapped. Yes. Uh, because of mountain slide and so on. And they were without access to food, security, shelter, anything. Yes. And they were going for pilgrimage to worship idols. Yes. To a temple, to mandir. Yes. Right? Now, me being Muslim, and they're going to worship uh, idols, uh, uh, or they're going on their holy journey. Yes. You know, and uh, one is being Muslim, and another one being imam and a scholar. How do you square with this situation? Yes. So, sometimes a situation like this comes, where basically you would hesitate, um, but then you have to put your humanitarian hat on. Yes and put your basically personal and emotional feeling aside and go with your humanitarian mission. Yeah, alhamdulillah. 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 And that's what we did. Alhamdulillah. Uh, subhanallah. Uh, once uh, we were in the uh, Philippines um, and we were going with the medical convoy, yes. including mobile medical unit with doctors and nurses, you know, whole caravan was going. Right in front of us there was accident. Yes. And uh, the, it was a truck, basically, which was carrying people, mm. so army type of truck, uh, that fell down. It was night time, no light as such. It was because in Philippines, in that area, there was hurricane. 500 mile area was underwater, yes. no electricity, no nothing. When we saw them, quickly we brought our tents open up, we had doctors, nurses with us, we set up quickly and I start treating them. And they were bleeding like anything. SubhanAllah. You know? And uh, because of darkness, uh, we couldn't see who they are. Um, and uh, uh, obviously because of medical situation, I'm non-medical person, so uh, I didn't try to find out who are these guys or to speak to them. I let it, left it, uh, the medical to, team to my do medical work, team yeah. to do the work. And they were treated and it is almost certain that many of them, their life was saved because of this treatment. Do you know who they were? No. They were Israeli soldiers on humanitarian mission. Yeah. Now just imagine if I if I knew would, that, if that, I knew that, that information. Yeah then what would have been my reaction? Subhanallah. Allah kept it that secret from me. But what happened after that? We applied to establish hospital in Gaza. Because of that incident? Yeah. Uh, not because of that incident, just uh, as part, after, of, our, after uh, that, yeah. uh, as part yeah. of our normal, you can say, progress in Gaza. And we had meeting in UK uh, with the main stakeholders, countries that are involved, basically including Jordan, uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, Egypt, Turkey, mm -hmm. and so on like that, uh, Lebanon, uh, America, Israel also, and so on. And we had to discuss with them about this project and so on. Obviously, for a project such big, it was six-story build. It is six-story building. The mashallah. plan was in Gaza. Yes, yes. in Khan Yunus. Uh, the building is still there, mashallah. It was running up to February this year. Yes. Um, in 2016, to co come up with that concept, just imagine how many years it would take you to construct that, while basically no other organization prior to that has managed to complete even one clinic. Subhanallah. Unless it is governmental organizations like Indonesia or like Qatar or like that. But so you, you had to go physically to, to Gaza? Have, you, have you been to Gaza? Yeah, uh, this, ha this came as a result of a number of my visits to Gaza. To Gaza. Yes, um, I've been to Gaza many times. Please describe for us a little bit uh, about Gaza because many of us have not been uh, to Gaza. So, um, In the world, two uh, countries I've been to are the most humble and nicest people I have ever met. Subhanallah. And you know, I'm a person, mashallah, uh, British government have given me two passports. Yes. 
and you would struggle to find a page on my passport to put a stamp. It's full. It's full. Right? Um, while I have two passports, mashallah. The British government has given uh, two passports to very few people, those yes. who travel quite a lot. Of, so, so both of them are valid? Both both of, yeah, both yeah. of them are valid at yeah. the same time and so on. Um, so uh, the passport I came on here um, hardly has much space. Uh, you know. So, so if you look at my previous passports and so on, so there, there are more than possibly 120, 130 countries I have visited in the world. So I'm speaking truly from uh, a traveler experience yes. that there are two nations that I have met which are most humble, uh, most disciplined. One of them is Gaza and second one Japan. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Yeah. I haven't seen more, mashallah, nicest people with their characters, with their akhlaq and so on. You know, there was uh, floods in America a yes. couple of years back. And um, the relief from government took a bit longer to come. And suddenly there was looting yes. of the shops and so on, breaking. Because of, one is basically because of any you can say violence or like that or any any people else. who take maybe advantage of the situation, the situation. Yes. but this is because of humanitarian thing that aid didn't receive reach on time to them yes people of Gaza go through this situation almost on daily basis and they never looted they never looted any shop subhanallah yeah. nowadays you will hear basically that uh, truck coming in and everybody jumping on that I don't think they, I wouldn't call that looting. That's not looting. Because that doesn't belong to anybody. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it belongs it's, to it's them. To them, yeah. Uh, I, and I they would, have reached the level of starvation. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So they're just taking what belongs to them. Yes. What, what Allah has written for them, mashallah. So such a disciplined people that even during the war, not now when everything is finished, but uh, in previous years, during the war, they were keeping law and order up to the uh, following traffic Subhanahu. rules, Subhanahu. even during the wars, previous wars. I'm talking about. Such a disciplined people, I've never and seen. And that's them. why Allah is giving them now, uh, you know, uh, patience and steadfast. Uh, they're holding their ground, they're hmm. holding their principle. Uh, I think no other nation would have been able to withstand what the people of Gaza are going through at the moment? Allah almost and may Allah keep us on uh, Iman. I think if rest of the world would have faced similar situation, they would have left their Islam. Yes, indeed. You know, to save their life, their family, they would have their, left their religion, many of us. But these people, subhanAllah, you know, they're going through worse, you can say, uh, barbaric attacks and worse level of zulm. Subhanahu. Yet, um, uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Now, uh, Imam Qasim, what is happening to Gaza at the moment yes. has reflected a huge wave in the world, especially the Western world. So many Europeans and Americans coming to the state, to the fold of Islam. Yes. And so many people understanding the reality and the truth about the case of Palestine and protest has been uh, you know I would say crushing the world yes. and invading the entire world yes. and now it, it has even reached to the highest esteem organizations like educational institutions yes. the, the major universities of the world students are protesting please you know share with us the experience in the UK in terms of solidarity People, you know, uh, being, I, I've seen so many videos of people, you know, with tattoos, people who don't believe in any, you know, supreme divine power, and yet they became Muslims or they are holding very uh, tight grounds on the, the, the issue of Palestine. Please uh, tell us about uh, that. Yes, uh, first of all, um, again, I might I'm upset many people. This. Uh, the credit of this doesn't go to Muslims. Indeed. You know, whatever revelation happening and changing of basically situation in the world in relation to Palestine, the credit doesn't go to us. It goes to Muslim. the non-Muslims. 
it goes to non-Muslims who are standing up for sake of humanity. Had it been upon us as Muslims, we would have remained quiet we, as we were quiet at the time of Afghanistan, as we, we were quiet we at the time them. of uh, Iraq, yes. and so on. We just jumping on the wagon, yes, you know, and we are being part of demonstrations because others have courage uh, and ha others have taken steps. I'm not saying that all the Muslims are like that, but generally, general public is encouraged by these steps of others. But until today, uh, Imam Qasim, you have Muslims who do not boycott products. You have Muslims who speak uh, uh, in a very ill way yes. about uh, our brothers and sisters in, in Palestine. Yes. You have Muslims who are living in their own world, celebrating and enjoying themselves. They don't care about the thousands of children that are being slaughtered in, in this genocide every single day. So we are in a deep ghafla. Yes. Um, and, uh, you, you see, Muqata, uh, the boycott, people need to realize that is not basically a call of 21st century or is not basically latest innovation or innovation started from South Africa. Muqata ah is linked to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi wa sallam, mashallah, he also boycotted yes. in his life. Yes. Um, uh, and requesting basically his followers from Quraysh and so on. So it is Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you see, uh, uh, these people and these countries stand on economy. Yes. And that's where it hurts them most. They only understand the, uh, the, the language of money. M money, that's right. Yes. yes. You see, um, uh, Subhanallah, uh, uh, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of UK, uh, and I belong to UK, um, um, he was not basically bowing down to the pressure of uh, the public, uh, the public, and so on. Yes. But the moment Yemenis they stop British pet petroleum ships cargo, from, from passing cargo the Red Sea, vessels, yeah. immediately he said there should be ceasefire. Yes. Right. So because it hurt him that this is hurting our uh, economy. Economy. Mm. And that's the language uh, they, they understand. So, so subhanAllah, uh, muqata'a is one is sunnah, and second one, it definitely works, and so on. And, and it's an obligation uh, on us now. Uh, this is the least we can do. Yes. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, I can't seem to understand how I would sacrifice the blood of my brothers and sisters for coffee or a burger or fast food. Mm. You know, I'm not going to starve to death if I don't have it. So this is the least that you can do is boycott and the, the and product. To be honest, it's not only up to drinks or snacks. We have limited ourselves to meal or drinks mm. when it comes to boycott. There are apps available yes. on uh, Google Play Store or on iOS for iPhone or Samsung or like that. There are apps available to boycott. Yes. Uh, you can scan the barcode of any item and it will tell you this item is safe to buy or not. Mm, you know, there are certain scholars now in the world, they have said to purchase those products that are aiding Israel is haram. Subhanallah. And that includes my uncle, Sheikh Taqi Uthmani. Uh, yes. uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him health, healthy life. I mean, I mean. Uh, in Pakistan, mashallah. He clearly said, that um, to do muqata ah of those companies that are supporting this war, that are financing uh, this war, is wajib, is farad uh, upon the ummah, and to use their products is haram. Subhanallah. Uh, subhanallah. Um, and uh, they've gone beyond that. Uh, they've gone to the level, uh, many scholars in the world, that if you have done your hajj already, then instead of going for additional hajj or additional umrah, you send that money to, people to, to of, the people uh, of Gaza. Gaza, Gaza, people Gaza. So, alhamdulillah, uh, this awareness is there. Uh, people are be being given guidance. I think people need to follow it um, with the uh, intention of a uh, sense of responsibility and spiritual guidance, inshallah. There are two more things that uh, I want to ask you, Imam Qasim. One of them is the hijrah of uh, the migration of many Muslims uh, to the east, back to the east. 
to the Muslim nations because it is no longer comfortable to live in the Western world with a lot of things that are happening, especially in raising our children. So is, did you notice that uh, there are a lot of Muslims migrating back to the Islamic world? Uh, personally, I have heard few individual families yes. um, uh, considering that. But certainly from UK uh, and similar few countries, uh, uh, not really, and no, I wouldn't even advise. Yes. Because I still believe that UK is one of the most ideal country for any re religion people to practice their religion freely. Yes. Uh, if I give you my own example, I have never been to primary, secondary school. We touched upon that earlier. Yes. But after my study, which was in Arabic and Urdu language, yes. I established primary and secondary school without any qualification. Subhanallah. No qualification. I have never been to school. No GCSE, no A level. No teacher can claim that I have taught him A, B, C, or 1, 2, 3, 4. Subhanallah. Yet I had that freedom. The system gave me that freedom. Not only that, I established TV channel, Iqra TV, Inshallah. to teach Quran and Fiqh and so on like that. How many Islamic countries will allow me to establish TV channel? Unfortunately, no, no, very no, few. no countries, very, or very few. You know, will, you, will you, allow you, you, you are that. here in yeah. Yemen running this TV channel, mashallah. Hey, within Oman. This, Oman, sorry. Oman, Oman uh, uh, running this TV channel, mashallah you would know the struggle you will face on certain of your programs in other Islamic countries. Indeed, indeed. You know, that's, so, that's very uh, true. So basically, uh, many, or I would say majority of the Muslim countries, you cannot practice your religion as freely as you can practice in these countries. And I one. think there is hope with the, with the increase in the number of Muslims in Europe, Sooner or later, the majorities if I give you are a, going to be Muslim. If, if I add to uh, your uh, uh, suggestion, we are only 4% of the population, 4 to 5% of UK. Yes. But in terms of economy, we are 15%. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. We, we are giving 15% to, to UK. To, to economy. the economy of the UK. Yes, we are 5%. In terms of politics, we are heavily involved. And uh, subhanAllah, this, uh, there was internal council, local level elections recently, just a few weeks ago in UK. Yes. And those elections were heavily dominated by Gaza situation. SubhanAllah. Wherever there are majority Muslims, definitely that impacted major ruling parties and other independent candidates, in most cases Muslims, they came up front. MashaAllah. You know, so... This local election has reshaped the politics of UK. Yes. Just imagine if this is happening in local election, what will happen in general election? We are already preparing for general elections in UK. We already have, mashallah, you can say, uh, discussions and uh, thought going on on how to basically bring just and right people. Does it have to be Muslim? has to be someone who speaks sound, who stands for humanity. Justice. Yes. yes. So, mashallah, in many areas we support non-Muslim candidates. Uh, we are working as one humanitarian cause, mashallah. So, uh, and you will see that uh, when elections come in America, it will have huge impact. What you touched earlier upon universities. Yes. These uh, that age, they are at that age that they are the future of any country. The future leaders. Yes. Yes. You know, and for them to be waken up, not as individual pockets, not as minority of that camp uh, uh, campus, uh, but as majority or over 50% of them. Is a good sign. Yes. Uh, amazing sign, Mashallah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil uh, Alameen, Allah uh, has awakened the hearts from the calamities that is happening in Gaza. Uh, but there are also other types of hearts that I want to ask you about is your experience in teaching the prisoners and yes. uh, preaching them. You know, what is the story behind the uh, prisons? When I finished my education, um, at that time, uh, as I said, from childhood I am a different person. Uh, yes. You know, I say that my brain is upside down or like that maybe. Well, I think differently. 
so I said I don't want to go into traditional work where basically you graduate, you pick a masjid, you become imam, and then in the evening you teach madrasa or yes. kids, and you deliver Juma lecture and that's it. No, I want to do something beyond that. Yes. So I was searching, searching, what else can I do? You know, so two things I started. One is basically uh, Hajj and Umrah advisory service. No. Those who wants to go for Hajj and Umrah, at that time it was a big thing because yes. people didn't have that guidance. Um, and uh, uh, my main activity, I started to visit prisons. Yes. Now, I told you just a while ago that we, when it comes to economy, we are 15%. That's right. But sadly, we are 4% of 4 to 5% population, but in prison we are 20%. Subhanallah, mm -hmm. I've heard this before yeah. and uh, I didn't know what is the root cause for this. Why do we have so many Muslims in prison? Uh, the root cause is two. Uh, one is basically uh, being picked up unjustly. Okay. Um, so it is started, for example, from Algerian revolution. Mm -hmm. So anybody from Algeria was, you can say, subject to arrest and so on. That filled you can say a lot of prisons and any war going on then anybody is speaking um, or is standing up basically or trying to you know people get emotion and they when Iraq war happening they try to attack and, or counter attack and so on uh, so obviously they get arrested yes, you know. yes. Uh, that's one secondly sadly uh, um, uh, in certain Muslim countries there is a l there is a lot of fraud yes to the extent that their upbringing is uh, based on that, based on that, that they don't even consider that as wrong activity. Islamically, it's not accepted. Yes, so they they do a lot of financial frauds. So when they come to European countries, they they still continue they, practicing fraud. Th that's right. Yes, mm. um, and uh, they do. Uh, so some of them come up with silly argument that oh, this is non-Islamic country, and we can con the government here. Or still, this it's and not that. acceptable. Or we so can do no. credit card frauds and so on. But eventually, you will get caught. Yes, and that fills uh, prisons uh, quite a lot. So what was your role uh, there in, in prison? Uh, so Imam? what uh, I thought at that time is basically that those people who are in prison, they have lots of free time. Yes. And that time is not being utilized properly. No, sure. If I can engage them with Islamic education, with Tarabiyya, with a right upbringing, at least they will not go back to prison. Yes. And they will come out much better person. Alhamdulillah. So I started advocating for halal food for all prisons uh, in UK. Uh, that m if if they declare themselves Muslim, Muslims, then they should be given not as a choice but mandatory uh, access halal to food. halal food, mm -hmm. and so on. And because of these things, mashallah, many non-Muslims started to become Muslim. Mashallah. Uh, many people they started to keep beard uh, mashallah. in prison. Mashallah. So many people became imams inside while inside prison. Mashallah. 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 Leading salah and studying and so on. So Alhamdulillah, it changed the dynamic of uh, prison service in UK. Mashallah. Now, when I started at that time, it was not a paid job. Yes. You had to do freely at yes. your own cost. Then uh, uh, there is uh, one uh, Islamic center established by Saudi, Saudi yes. Arabia and managed by Egyptian Imams yes. uh, in London called Islamic Cultural Center, ICC, Regent's Park Mosque. Um, Hamid Al-Majid was director at that time. Uh, yes. With him I had discussion and I said we need to request home office to pay Imams. Yes. Because they're paying other faith leaders mm. to visit and to provide. To sustain it. it. Yes. So imams need to be paid. Now, at that time, in those days, in 1990s, I'm talking about 96, 95, 96, the minimum salary of UK was around three pound, two pound fifty or three pound, under three pound, basically, yes. per hour. Yes. That anybody has to earn minimum three pound per hour, you cannot pay less than that. That was minimum salary. Yes. Um, I fought, mashallah, uh, with home office uh, for the rights of imams and they agreed to pay uh, more than 12 pound per hour. Mashallah. Uh, to imams. Mashallah. As soon as they agreed to pay, I resigned. Mashallah. I said, now you will have lots of imams coming. Mashallah. Mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, mashallah, uh, since then up to now, uh, there are hundreds of imams uh, 
Alhamdulillah. In UK, mashallah, that this is their uh, daily routine. Alhamdulillah. 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 And that is creating huge impact, mashallah. Uh, I hate to end uh, this uh, interview, yeah. you know, talking to you, mashallah, uh, is a wealth of knowledge, mashallah. Uh, I want you to give us the last advice to the Muslim world. How can they be united in these difficult moments that we're going through? Yes, uh, it's very important for us, first of all, to remember that we are human beings first. Um, and uh, we have to fulfill uh, the responsibility given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you also mentioned in the beginning, Khalifa al Fir'ad. Yes. Inni Khalifa. So we are the custodian and we need to look after basically not only fellow Muslims but environment and so on. So um, in terms of unity, uh, it's very easy to blame governments, to blame others, to blame everybody else apart from yourself. Yes. But uh, change will not happen unless you change yourself. Yes. If families can correct, only then the community will be corrected. Yes. If communities are corrected, only then the society and the county and the district will correct. Once districts are and areas are corrected, then the country will be correct and so on. It will expand yeah, to the yeah, world. Yeah. It cannot happen basically from up to downward. It has to start oh. from down from towards down. up, inshallah. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Imam Qasim Rashid Ahmed, all yes. the way from the UK. We have been honored to have you on our show and having you in Oman as well. I hope it's not the last time you visit Oman. Yes. Please, next time, don't come for one day, you know, come for a long uh, period of time so that we can learn and benefit more from you. Jazakallah khair, uh, Imam, and uh, safe journey back home, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah. Dear brothers and sisters, thank you very much for listening and watching Dome Podcast. I'm your host, Hatem al-Abdissalam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.